I'm joining this presentation with my colleagues, the Taya Walker and Adam Santos today. So my name is Sujin Lee. I'm a deputy director of the data analytics at the mayor's office econo for economic opportunity. And nice to meet you, everyone. And uh, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Sujin. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam. I'm a senior data scientist at NYC Opportunity. And good morning, everybody. My name is Taya Walker. I'm the director of our enterprise data solutions team here at NYC Opportunity. And I'll just make a note that before we start, just to give a quick uh, uh, note on what we do at, here at the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, not always apparent in our name, but NYC Opportunity joins evidence-based research along with digital data and design innovation to help the city reduce poverty and increase equity. Today's presentation, I think, touches on all of these aspects, so we hope you hear it and see it when we go over it today. Thank you. Okay, great. So today we want to share the most exciting data integration project in the city of the New York. So last December, our team launched the Workforce Data Portal sourced by our integrated uh, data platform. So to build this integrated the data platform, we have collected individual level data from the city's workforce program participants, the demography, and to the like program, like transaction record from the multiple partner city agencies. And in addition to that administrative data, we are also have, we also have the New York State individual level wage record. So with this order rich data set, we are able to make the city's work for, workforce data more accessible and then meaningful by yeah, visualizing outcomes and then research on the portal. And so this is, yeah, what we going to talk. And then as you see in the agenda, this is the workforce the data portal and then the integrated the data platform, which is like yeah, sourcing this data portal are the two main things we are going to present the today. And Let's get started this presentation and with the project of motivation. So helping the resident, yeah, acquire the skill set and then secure their like the employment is the significant government the investment. And New York City government also has delivered over 75 programs, like through 18 the city agencies and also dozens of the service providers. And, but the program model and then the target population and then strategies are really varies by the, so while this, the, all the diverse of the workforce programs are run by like the multiple agencies and then service providers, like for practical reasons, the city had a big challenging from the data perspective. So as you can imagine, each the New York City agencies, like, like own the, their own the programs and then they serve their target population. And then they build the data, their own the database the system, which stored all information from the, their program, like including participants, like demographics and then their program level data. And then, so there are multiple, like, yeah, distinct the database system across the agency, but this all the database system don't necessarily talk to each other. So, which means there is no like single, like workforce development that in the city of the New York. So as a result, there's the no way to develop the insights from the like the, the comprehensive the view. Also, while like the city the New York City resident interacted with the multiple the city's workforce project programs like at the same time or over the course of the years, but it was really hard to do cross agency or cross program analysis with this fragmented the data system. And additionally, there had been no common the definitions for these programs like progress or outcome the metrics across the city. So these are the like challenges in the like the city's the workforce system. So like to tackle these issues, like our office, the mayor's office for economic opportunity, we yeah, we lead the the integrated workforce data project with the, this list of the four goals on this slide. So the first, we, so yeah, the first goal is to set the standardized the measures and then definition with the multiple stakeholders, including cities, workforce agencies, and then mayor's office of the 
a workforce development, and then the think tank out of the city, and also more organization. So this, yeah, the, the standardized the metrics, which we can apply to the most of the older cities, the program. And, also, and then we called this, like the performance metrics is the common metrics. And then that's how we branding this standardized the metrics. And then you can see the actual, the performance metrics outputs on the portal soon during the demo. And then I think, yeah, then I can combine the second, third order together. And then, so now we like first define the common performance metrics, which we can apply across the many programs. And then the following, the next step is actually to create a single data platform to integrate it or the administrative the data. As I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, our office collect the individual level data from multiple city agencies. And also we have the data sharing agreement with the New York state. So like we to receive the quarterly wage data for all individuals in our the data platform. And then, so you can imagine like we have the our personal level demographic information who participate, participated the city's program. And also we have their program level data. And on top of that, we also have the individual level quarterly waste data. So this every the data set is the one single data platform. And then yeah, with this platform, we can analyze the workforce program outcomes and also this enable us the further research around the city's workforce the, the project. And then I really want to highlight the hour the wage record around this project because Having the wage, the record of the program participants open us so many like potential research opportunities since like we can measure like the short and then long term the wage outcomes for the city program participants. And also this most of the our program data started 2014, but our wage data is going back to the 2012. So if we can like yeah, measuring like the pre outcomes and then like how their wage outcomes are changing after the program. So this, yeah, the wage data is the big asset in the, this platform. And then the last goal is like to release the data tools and then products to inform city leadership and then our partner agencies and then service provider and then researchers and also the funders. And this workforce data portal we are going to demo soon is our really the first data tool. And then, yeah, we'll demo the workforce data portal to show how these our the goals are really turned into the, the real things. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Santos, um, and I'm going to show you the workforce data portal. And we're starting here at the end of our process of integrating data from different New York City workforce programs and showing you the end, one of the end products of this project. And before I start, I want to go over quickly some vocabulary because there are two keywords that I have used interchangeably and confuse in my head all the time. So I just want to be uh, clear before, before I start that. Or first, Sujin, yeah, sorry, Sujin put the mm -hmm. link to the U URL. To, to the portal in the chat. Uh, if you want to click around the site, follow along, it's there, it's there. Sorry, the two P words. Uh, first is the data portal. And so when I talk about the portal, what I mean is this site that is used to display the metrics and the, re the results of this project. The other P word is the platform. When I talk about the platform, what I'm referring to is the database and the processes that come together to capture all of this program data in one place. And so portal is the website, platform is the, the data. Okay, so if you go to workforcedata.nyc.gov, you are greeted by this very friendly welcome message. And then as we scroll down, there are two main data sections of the site. The first is common metrics, which Sujin talked about earlier and we're going to take a deeper dive into that section. And then there's a section called data stories, which we'll also, which we'll also talk about. I'm going to first click on the menu before I go to those two sections. 
because there are actually five sections of, of this site. The first is the about section that gives an overview of the project and the portal, similar to what Sujin just described. Common metrics, data stories, we'll talk about data guidance as, as we move forward. Af after I talk about the portal, Tayeb is going to go over the process for how we integrated the data from different programs. And that data comes from lots of different systems, as time we'll talk about. And so there's lots of context required around all, all, where the data is coming from, what's in all of the data. And this data guidance section gives those data notes that if you want to do a deep dive into the data, like we'll give you context for those things. And then the program section outlines, has descriptions of all of the programs that contribute data uh, to the platform. Um, in the slide earlier, Sujin said that uh, there are 18 different city agencies that have workforce programs. Uh, currently uh, on the portal, we're showing data, or in the platform, we have data from five different city agencies. Um, so we're still working on with other agents to be able to get all of workforce, all of the workforce programs into the platform. However, we do have the larger workforce programs. And so we estimate that we have approximately 50% of clients who attend workforce programs. Okay, we're going to move on to the common metrics section. Now, as Sujin talked about before, the common metrics is a, a set of performance measures that can be applied across different programs. With so many different programs, uh, sometimes pr different programs use the same word to mean different things. And so a group got together at the beginning of the project and defined what, what different workforce terms meant. So if we look at down here, it says metric one out of 13, we have 13 different common metrics. And so one example of a common metric is client served or how many unique people attended a workforce. If we open up the navigation menu, you can see all of the 13 metrics listed here, and they're in some bigger categories, such as full-time placements, part-time placements, and we have training information, we have academic program information, because these are all activities that lead to helping people find and get better jobs. But I also want to highlight the last four which are job retention and job continuity. Those metrics use the New York State quarterly wage data to see if people are still in jobs or have continued in jobs after receiving placements from programs. And so I think that's a, a very cool thing to be able to use the, the state wage data when applying these common metrics. So this common metrics section is a big dashboard that displays the results of the different metrics. So you can see here that since 2017 or between 2017 and the data on the site is refreshed or is updated through March of 2021. And so stay tuned for um, further updates of when we add more data. But so between the beginning of 2017 and March of 2021, we see that there are 506,000 unique uh, clients half a million. If you're interested in a different time span, this filter allows you to change the start and end dates. You can also filter by the program population if you're interested in a subset of which programs are targeted toward different populations. And so if you're on the site, feel free to click around, play and play around with those. And so now I'm going to give an example of how would you use this dashboard to come up with insights or analyze what's happening? So if we open up this first chart here, this shows, oh, sorry, backing up a little bit here, it shows uh, different visualizations of the whichever common metric that you choose broken down by different demographics. And so we here we have by gender, race and ethnicity, and age. So if we open this first chart, it expands. In the chart, you can click on data notes so you can get some uh, more context behind what's being shown in the graph. Here, this shows the breakdown between women and men and also unknown or not reported. And just to come up with some insights from this graph, 2017, 2018, 2019, the total number of unique creeps steadily upward. 
as workforce programs expand, serve more people. But then in 2020, there's this steep drop off um, as COVID ha happened in 2020 and lots of the world is shut down. And so uh, workforce programs in New York City were no exception. So lots of programs had to pause and change the way that they operate. And so you can see that the capacity went down quite a bit. 2021, that bar is lower because as I said before, the data is only updated through March of 2021. So it only has three months of 2021. Another functionality of this graph is that you can download the chart as an image file, or you can see the underlying numbers in this chart, and then you could download this table in, in an Excel file. Okay, that is a snippet of the common metrics. We are now going to transition and talk about data stories. Now, the common metrics are great because it provides this common language that programs can use or we can use to talk about programs. But as Sujin talked about before, we have much more data than just the, the common metrics. We have inf info and Taib will go through what, what info we have, but we have lots of data on who's participating, when they're participating, and also the wage data. And so this opens up the possibility for lots of different deeper research questions. And so the data stories section of the site is a place where we can display some of these research questions that, that we've attempted to answer and also get ideas from people for questions to answer. And so we have currently, we have four data stories on the, in this section. The first is titled cross agency participation. One of the unique things about the platform is that we're able to see when clients go from one program to another. And that's not possible if you're just going program to program. And so this story highlights that aspect of the platform. Client serve demographics shows who is attending workforce programs. And then we have a mapping data story to show like where clients are um, in the city. But I am going to focus on and talk a little more deeply about our data story about COVID-19 and wage loss. So you can, if you're on the site, you can read through the background and the methodology here. But the gist of the this story is that we looked at clients who were, quote, stably employed in the two years before COVID. And the way that we define that is we, again, looked at the New York State wage data and saw all of those clients who had earnings in at least six of the eight quarters in the two years previous. And then we defined this term wage loss, which was the percent of those people who did not have wages in a given quarter. So if we look at the first visualization and that I want to highlight is 300, over 300,000 people. And so if we look at the first visualization here, if you look at the blue bars, these are the percent of people who do not have any earnings in each quarter, two years before COVID. And then starting in quarter two of 2020, you can see the purple bars that the number of people, and again, these are all clients who had, had quote, stable employment or were employed six out of the eight quarters. And so that those numbers jump up. And so I think that this really illustrates that COVID negatively affected lot, lots of jobs and lots of employment. And you can see that was definitely the case for the clients of workforce programs. We also then break down, break these down by race and ethnicity, break it down by age, wage level. I'm not going to go through e each one specifically for the sake of time, but if you're interested, the URL is in the chat and feel free to click around. Okay. That is the workforce data portal. I am going to stop sharing and pass over to Tayeb. We'll talk about the process that we went through to create the. Thank you, Adam. And before I start this section here, I think there were two questions in the chat. Just uh, quickly address that came up. One is in regards to the underlying data that is actually behind our in the or the use for the portal. And in the portal, all of this data typically is it, it's visualized as aggregated data. I would urge people to read data guidance if they're interested in delving into that a little bit more deeply. But the data set actually is available on open data, the larger full data set, not identifiable 
not quite level, but the a full set of aggregated um, data across metrics, demographics, and whatnot is now available in open data. If you have questions or are really interested in delving deeply into this area, we'd love to hear about what you what you're interested in and what you're doing. The other question that came up, I, I think, was a reference to one of the, the charts that Adam showed, and, it, and the question came around the different gender differences. Why it doesn't appear that more women are in um, the workforce program than men? And I would say, Iris, with uh, any questions that come up today around that are specific to workforce itself, I'm going to uh, start off with a caveat that says all of them are valid and worth investigating. I will throw out uh, one particular hypothesis. I don't be within the programs that we are capturing in the, uh, in the workforce portal. The, one of the biggest ones are our workforce programs that are run, managed, and operated for people who are actually on public uh, assistance benefits. And and if you carry that through, there is some research on sort of the gender process and that is surrounding people's getting into the public assistance system, particularly where there are more women, particularly mothers that may be in the system. In the system. So that may be one explanation why we see a higher, a slightly higher percentage on that. But again, hypothesis, everything worth for research. So with that, I'm going to pick up where Adam left off and talk about something that really, I think is important to us and that we hope is important to the audience here besides this uh, what we believe we think is a, our beautiful baby of a portal that presents all of this data. But behind all of that, as Adam noted, that this digital the portal is a digital product. It's an end product of a, a much larger data platform with rich data that, you know, really from day one, we, when we embarked this project, was designed to enable research. If you think about it for a moment, the origin of this project began with that sort of critical challenge that Sujin brought up earlier, and the fact that the city managed a very large, complicated, multi-agency, multi-provide workforce system, and that workforce system often outside of the city, even within the city, the common, the really big questions around it is how well are programs really achieving outcomes that they intend to. Hence the reason why the idea of the common metrics. And this is not in New York City. It's not, you know, specific to New York City. It is, I think, a, a natural problem, a, a challenge from what we've heard. Does a uh, getting program, going from program to program, whether they're privately funded or publicly funded, to talk about the way and begin to measure in a uh, standardized way these outcomes. So if you're looking at the system in a holistic manner versus in a program, apples to oranges type of scenario. And so, with, for us, when we started with the common metrics, looking at the common metrics or the, the categories of common metrics that are out there, it was the, the first goal was build a system so that we can identify and begin to measure against these categories. Now, from a, a data point of view, a data science point of view, a researcher point of view, data analysts were just sheer curious out of curiosity. When you look at each of these metrics, they themselves are, in essence, really discrete research questions. And you can be thinking that whether it's client server, we can turn these into questions. We can also think about them in different ways, not just training, but even particular types of training or particular types of degrees. And from our perspective at NYC Opportunity, when we began this project from a data point of view, we made a very clear distinction between focusing on building out a data repository that answered those 13 questions versus building out a data repository that enabled a wide breadth of research. I think most of us know the questions you have today lead to new questions and that we cannot anticipate. So the best we could do is really begin to think broadly about all the types of things we might anticipate. I'm happy to say that portal represents, sits on top of the, what we hope is a growing repository that enables research and it enables it in five key ways. And so it's we provide, we've talked about, we've heard the areas of data that we have, different types of data. Obviously, um, and this speaks to breaking down silos. Once um, you have the appropriate legal policy framework in play, you can begin really uh, testing out your theories about the fact that for clients who may engage in one program, engage in multiple programs. 
and likely may engage in them multiple times as well. And so if that information is being tracked in fund binding system or a series of systems, they still as discrete transactions. So a program may know a person, but they may not know that that same person is engaging elsewhere. When we bring data together, we can now begin linking that data. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then two, I would say support, support areas uh, that were, that are important for a project like this and important for, I think, the long-term vision for enabled research is privacy and preservation and methodology around that, as well as data documentation, which I, I talked about a little bit. Just to start out with the research here, and just a camera at home, this platform, it, if you're, if you go on the site and followed along with that, what you'll notice is that uh, you go into common metrics and you can select different time periods and years or whatnot. You will notice I'm saying we have 10 years of data. We've actually put a five-year window on um, the site. And part of the reason is uh, that without the opportunity to explain all of the nuance of the data for this audience, the at 2017 was at about the point where every single program that is in this part of the data sharing initiative actually had data, either the program was operating in that manner by 2017 or the data available was in 2017. So data goes back much farther, but then it gets, starts to get uh, their gaps between programs. And what you see is the most of uh, the point of the most consistent view. There are obviously, we're talking about multi-source. We've talked about, you know, eight programs and five vacancies and, uh, and this is coming from many different systems that are working make the basis of sort of the data sharing here. I will say one of the methodologies that we use to keep with the theme of common metrics is that, as we know, data is collected and it is uh, kept in many different formats. Unfortunately, there are no common uh, standards or taxonomies around how our case management or data collection systems are built and managed. And whenever any of us uh, in the audience are involved in these type of data type of uh, 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 projects, the first thing that we have to deal with is the messiness of the data. And so uh, one of the things that we have worked with is providing, even imposing and developing with agencies, standard ways to inform their data exchange and to bring this. Additionally, with the administrative data, so worth noting again that we're getting uh, New York State quarterly wage data. And while um, in terms of the portal that you see, we've updated it to March 2021, the data on the platform, this integrated data platform, is continually updated on a near monthly basis for most programs, unless they run in a more or less frequent intervals, for example, like the summer youth employment program at DYC. And finally, um, as I mentioned, this is, we take these kind of, we do our best to standardize data and put it into a single um, data model. I don't want to get overly technical, a big old database, and we're getting a lot of different data from a lot of different people. The easiest way to call it an integrated platform is to take your data set, put it over here, take your data set, put it over there, just be in one big database. We go a little bit further than that and say, hey, if we're getting job placement data from these seven places, it's all going to go in one place and it's all going to look as much as the same so that as we ask questions about, we can remove some of the kind of thought process it takes to get the answer. This data is multidimensional by that. As you can begin to assess out that while a lot of the common metrics are talking about counts of people, there's a, a rich you know, set of information about demographics and real workforce activities and outcomes around the jobs that people are being placed in, i.e. what uh, the titles that they're, the, the, the titles, the, when they got the job, what that initial wage, hourly wage might have been. But there's also information. A lot of our workforce programs are sitting run by providers. And so looking at, I think there are a range of questions we can begin to think about providers who are working with um, similar populations or one provider who's working across both employers as well. You know, now we have an interesting, like the first question we can even begin to ask is who happens to be the biggest employer of uh, I had New York City participant. And then finally, ways to that is coming in the number 54. You know, the next area is on the record linkage. I could geek out on this for a few hours if you are interested in learning out with us about um, probabilistic and algorithms and blocking strategies, so on and so forth. I think we can have a really fun conversation around that. But I would just say that 
It's all about matching and keeping things together. But beyond that, once we're able to match that a client moving through the system come and that is represented in different systems, once we can begin to bring that together from a research perspective, we can now do something that doesn't exist and a common identifier to that um, person. And so regardless if they're coming from program A, program B, program C, where they have their own identifiers in those programs, we can now bring a single identifier for the purpose of research. Just to give a, like a quick, I'm not going to go into uh, this too heavy, but to give a quick, I'm going to use the persona of Kathy, a, a fictionalized persona who is giving me perfect consent to uh, talk about her journey in our workforce system. But in this case, uh, this is a typical, but this is, this is literally based on kind of the types of things our record linkage process has to overcome. And this is just with names. So there are many other kind of key points that become part of this algorithm, but this is the, just the kind of sense of the challenge of bringing together and why you can't necessarily just completely match. And in this, in some cases, the, these different representations of the same Kathy do not have a, 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 another ID or a common address or a common phone number or anything to uh, link them together. So you're doing like kind of a number of different things. It gets messier than this. And I was a little bit too myself just to even talk about some of the things that we're seeing through there, but um, it all goes into trying to be really smart about the linkage process. So with that, it, this conversation talked about uh, silos. When we talk about information silos, our agencies and providers and many of you who are working in um, different domains, if you're in the data domain, there are great robust data collection processes that may be happening with the place in which you work. And the, the city is no different. I, so in this case, what I'm representing is the fact that we, when we look at Kathy, we actually find that through the data that's coming through us, she's actually um, been through the system multiple times in multiple different ways and had several different interactions. Now, if I go from one program to the next, they can give you the story of Kathy at that program. And a few years ago, she starts at DYCD, what she did, where she went. But beyond that, the program may not know or likely will not know exactly what happened to Kathy, what she had to the program, and would not know what may happen to or where Kathy was coming or circumstances that, in terms of her work, worst experience or other characteristics that may be relevant before she got to the program. And when this data all comes, the data is out there, but we're not able to even identify that there was an actual pathway that Kathy uh, went through the system. And so with our linkage and with this research platform, we're able to begin seeing that. And I, I suit you and then Adam have begun doing really different, interesting maps uh, that look at sort of clients. And then you can begin to group a pattern around how people are moving through the system in very interesting ways. This is really oversimplified um, in the sense that People go in and out, have spells of, of, of kind of interruption, but then there are people that overlap programs at multiple times in interesting. But beyond that, with the weights data, we add, we can add one more new dimension with this, and that is look at that pathway even beyond where, what we can identify in the city. So again, interesting ways for research to go. I'm going to wrap this up by saying two other kind of key um, points with building a platform like this is that thinking about privacy and we think about it in a number of ways, even de-identifying this data in the database itself. As often, once you have that research key, we don't really need to know that it's Kathy that's moving through the system, rather just that the records that represent Kathy all belong to each other. And additionally, putting field record on, on table level controls to minimize disclosures. Finally, I don't know, um, some of you may have attended our data doc, um, our uh, presentation open data last year, where we talked about our in development digital metadata catalog with the idea that every time we have data scientists or data analysts to present it with new data sets, our kind of instinct is to ask, hey, can you tell me something about it? a dictionary, some documentation? And the reality is it kind of is iffy that we might get something from day one of this project. Uh, we collected and worked with agencies to really collect extensive notes uh, with the idea that as a shared steward of this information, we should begin to be able to contextualize it for, in the way that agencies understand it operationally, things that they 
kind of thing you can trip against, things you should do, things you should not do, people that may look like this, but are not really that. And all of this has been documented in a piece. We've got a couple hundred pages worth of documentation, but we are now digitizing and making um, into a searchable catalog that it serves as a companion with this larger research repository. In the directions, I'll have to say that obviously we're always really um, interested in embarking on the next questions of how we have uh, the data stories as our way of talking about this. But I think there's uh, many interesting questions in working with agencies, academic and uh, practitioners out in the field to listen and say, what would you like to know if you now can see what could be an unprecedented view uh, of the system? brought together. Expanding data source, we talked, we have the five big programs that account for a little bit over 50% and growing. The way workforce works is that there'll be very big programs that are doing tens of thousands of people, and then it goes all the way to programs that deal with tens of people over the uh, course of years. So, so kind of the logic behind establishing this platform with the big ones first, and then working to scale on the smaller one. But that's not the there's other things besides workforce data that I think we'd all be interested in looking at in terms of contract fiscal information or other types of uh, information that uh, provide more insights into uh, the circumstances around the participants there that may give us some kind of ideas ar uh, around studying ways to better serve them. And then make, making this platform available for participating agencies and thinking broadly if the legal mechanisms allow how we can open it to external partners as well with the appropriate uh, mechanisms in place. And finally, the portal was the first of what will hopefully be many tools and services. So with that, that wraps up our uh, portion of today. Is in the chat as a link? And here is our email if you are interested in having questions or you're excited to nerd out with us in any one of the areas that we talked about today. So, uh, thank you. Maricela asks, do you plan on increasing the number of the agency that provide the workforce development? And the answer is yes. Like we, this like workforce data portal is really cover yeah, the, our first phase of the outreach with the agency and then yeah, and then we are like, yeah, we work, we like want to expand our the data set with the more like the new agencies. And I think there are two, yeah, immediate our interest in terms of the new agency. Like the first is we like want to expand like this workforce data with the more, yeah, the like if any programs who are targeting specific population, like including the Department of the Aging, they have the workforce programs for the senior population and also the mayor's office for the people's disability, like MOPD. We also like interested, yeah, including like some of the workforce programs who are serving like a specific population. So we like, yeah, those like are on the our list. And also another big part is as like the youth and the young adults population from yeah, DYCD, SYP, they are like huge population. And then, yeah, the city, yeah, it's the big budget for the city's the workforce, the development area. And then, but like the, because of the, their, like the, the characteristics, the youth and the young adults. So like the wage outcome is not the only outcomes we can measure the impact of the workforce program for the youth and the young adult participant. So we, but so that's why, like, we want to, we are really interested in working with the CUNY and then the DOE to get the, some more, yeah, the data around this youth and the young adults population. So they are like school attendance and then any attendance in the like admission in the CUNY. So like CUNY and then DOE is also our, the next, like the, yeah, the eight, like our the partner agency on our list. So like while we maintaining this portal, we also like, yeah, really interested in the, this expanding with the other agencies. And then Marcela asked another question, will you be expanding the demographic characteristics in the common metric? Yes. Yeah. This is also like, yeah, we have a lot more demographic field in our databases, but we just started with the most, the robust the field we have, so like which is the gender, the DOB, and then the race ethnicity. 
And then as you can imagine, this is all based on the administrative data. And then like, yeah, some of the data field is not really robust, but like we like, yeah, still working on, I think, yeah, immediately what we can add more is like race, the ethnicity and the gender. So we can have more like, yeah, the, yeah, we have, we can measure like black African American woman, like versus or other like race, ethnicity, gender group that also like can do it. And then we like education attainment before joining the program that is also like next, next the potential like demographic groups. And then we also have the veteran status. And then those, yeah, the characteristics is also many people are interested. And I hope, yeah, I answer your question. And then the next question is like regard that regarding higher data and then job loss data in addition to demographic, like age, gender, race, ethnicity, are there any data around the job types by skill level, industry, and then company size? Hey, Adam, anyone? Yeah, um, oh, good. You no, know, um, well, I can talk, I can talk about this one. Yes, we do have data around job types that comes from two different sources. The first is from the New York state wage data that we get the, when the state sends us data, that data, we get inf information about the employer and about the industry that the employer comes from. That data is a little bit messy and slightly limited. There are some sections of the data stories that talk about industry and that mostly comes from the, the NAICS code which is an industry code that they send. We also have information fr directly from programs about employers that people are directly placed into. So that only includes a subset of em employments, th those that people who are placed directly into jobs, those who go to training programs or academic programs or other miscellaneous workforce programs. We don't get, we don't get the, that info, but that data is a little more um, a little more complete but again is only a subset of what we have this is definitely something that we would like to look into i think the skill level or like job title part of it is something that we'd like to analyze but haven't haven't dug into thus far okay and yeah and then we have like other great questions so the next question is like what software is used to managing the your data have do you if you want to introduce like code linkies and then like yeah yeah so i was just saying um that it's a number depending on what you mean by minute but everything for stores like one at the city of new york and particularly as a agency of the city of new york we work very closely with our a centralized IT department known as the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, do it for short, and the city's cybersecurity practice to put this in a encrypted database. So there's a database technology around it. We do use cloud infrastructure to host like the portal or whatnot. So we're on a cloud-based um, infrastructure for that. In terms of the data as well, we use a number of tools out outside of that. So the site, which is actually using something called high charts to visualize through most of the visualizations, but internally we can use a number of things like Python or for the data. So it, it, it varies, bring your own tool type of thing to that, but big database, infrastructure, security, and then analytic tools are very that. Yes. And the next question is, how do you handle records of the clients who have not given consent or changing their lines? So many city programs have participants sign waivers. They don't really read or think about the, the consequences of the release information. Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's an excellent question. And it is particularly in the kind of scope of work that we do here. I. I think it bears, and at some point, uh, I'd like to talk about just have conversations around privacy and how we think about it here in the city. One, we, we talked very briefly about this, but there is a rather extensive legal framework around this. In fact, when we were at the Perfect Program, the first thing that we about was, uh, let's look at your kind of consent language. What does that mean? How well is it expressed with clients or whatnot? But a lot of this talked about 
or the way in which a lot of data sharing arrangements work in government when they do really go through deep, detailed, legal conversations. I would say that as much as we're talking and very excited about data set, there are things that don't come to us for good reason. There are things we don't ask for good reason on that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it like that's only one thing. And I think the incredible informed consent in and of itself is a, a larger issue. And I would say give us hopefully another year to talk about how we're beginning, how we're thinking about that in our next kind of wave of digital products coming up. But in the meantime, it's a big thing with that. I think it is it was a critical thing that we have to grapple. I would just say when I talk about privacy preservation, I want to be like really clear that even within our practice update, there are a number of firewalls we put just because you're on my data team here doesn't mean that you have access to the data. And frankly, the, the database that Sirjin and Adam and that platform, the portal even uses, we keep all of that client and we remove and strip all the client data away and, and because at that point it is not necessary and we are kind of very concerned about minimizing disclosure. But nonetheless, it's a, a good question. A larger legal framework over here, informed consent, I think is a, a larger topic to grapple with and explore. And certainly New York City is, is not exempt from that. Okay, great. I think our, the, we only have the one minute, but like last question is how do you envision policymakers using the, this data to make decisions around the investment in the certain programs? I can say real quick is that we one hope they uh, use it, hope that they that we get the feedback. This is fairly new, it was all arch in December. But the idea is that it can we can begin to be a little bit more transparent as a city about how we're managing programs and how we're serving particularly low income populations and marginalized vulnerable populations that are coming and uh, seeking help from the city with for workforce outcome. So the big thing I think right now is one kind of looking at how well the system is working, but uh, more importantly, taking that information to use it to inform policy and policy advocacy on best practices and programs that work right in with our kind of work around evidence-based research. And I, I think we're at time. Certainly a lot of great questions. Sorry, could not get through all of them here, but our email is uh, sent out again and we're, we're we're very excited about this and we hope that you are too and really interested in uh, thinking about ways in which you can grow and grow responsibly. So that, I think we will start to wrap up. Um, <laughs> thank you all for um, attending today and, and humoring us with your really rapt attention around this. Thank you, everyone. And then have a nice rest of the day.